Have you ever found yourself looking at a stock but not sure if you should trade it long or short? Hi, I'm Jeff Holden, head of recruiting at SMB Capital, a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan, trading equities, options, futures, and crypto as automated and discretionary traders. Today we speak with a trader who had this exact challenge. He was trading a stock with two conflicting catalysts, and we discussed why he decided to make a specific directional trade and how he managed his risk in that trade. I'm gonna be uh, presenting a day one gap fade meme version on Didi. Uh, and I took this trade about uh, two days ago on Monday, 6 6, 2022. Okay, just so for a bigger picture on SPY, we had dropped about 20% from the highs in January to a low of 380. And since then, we've retraced uh, in the past couple weeks to 411. And we've been in this downward channel for about 107 days since the high of that 479. So we've seen elevated VIX in the past couple months as SPIs and Qs have been falling uh, off their highs. But the Fed has also mentioned raising rates and we haven't seen an inflation risk. So just to set the stage for a, um, a bigger picture on the VIX, I just want to throw this slide in. So for a bigger picture on Didi, what is Didi? Didi Global is a China-based company engaged in the operation of a mobility technology platform. So it is very similar to Uber or Lyft that we have in the US, um, but this operates in China. They have about 550 million users uh, and tens of millions of drivers. And the company uh, provides an app-based tra transportation services regarding the following, so such as taxi, private cars, uh, social ride, bike sharing. Uh, and this is their overall business model. So for the first catalyst of Didi, um, the shares rose 70% in the pre-market from the previous day close on reports that regulators are concluding the investigations into the company. Now Didi has been one of the worst hit companies uh, since its IPO uh, as a lot of the China regulations have been tightening um, and also because of their cybersecurity. But there have been signs of regulatory easing from Beijing as China deals with economic fallout from the weeks long lockdown in Shanghai. So for Catalyst B, Didi was voted by its shareholders to delist from the New York Stock Exchange and they will be listing on Hong Kong instead. Now why is this important relative to the Catalyst A? Didi's IPO was one of the second biggest in the US, um, second behind BABA, um, and this gave Didi a $68 billion market cap when it did IPO. So US investors could be more willing to sell into any massive moves upward to cover any of the losses that they have taken on since the IPO. This is one of the things that we talk about a lot on the desk and one of the things I love about trading, um, particularly on our desk, is you have two very potentially important catalysts, but they're very different. And we don't necessarily know which one's going to play out because you have A, catalyst, which is decidedly positive, and B, catalyst, which could decidedly create a lot of overhang for the stock. So... You know, I'm interested to get into the trade and let's figure out kind of what happens and, and, and how you valued each piece of information that you were given. So here's a bigger picture DD chart since it's IPO. And you can see it's a macro downtrend and all pops um, have been getting sold into days after. So a couple months back, we had the big China bounce uh, right around here. And that pop ended up selling off completely and actually making a new low. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about this day right here. Uh, that was the day of the trade. The volume on that day is insane. Yeah, no, it, it was absolutely <laughs> bonkers. That's unbelievable volume for that day. Um, so I do want to put in a China bigger picture. As you can see, uh, I have Baba, KWeb, and Futu. Uh, KWeb is the internet ETF for China. Um, so this is just a macro um, outlook on what China's been doing. So they've been really beaten down. Um, but just want to throw this one in there to, to set the stage as uh, we were also looking at these uh, on the day of the trade too, as they were also in play. If you wanna learn three more real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window, so don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're gonna learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop 
than from years of online education. So for a trade strategy, with a, a trade that I would take like this, uh, I first of all need to have a news catalyst, which I have A and I have B. I have two news catalysts there. And then I would also need it to run up pre-market. So the news catalyst caused it to run pre-market. Next, I would like the stock to hit my market views and pass my backtest script. Uh, and then I would hit short at any retracements to the open price, add any of the retracements to VWAP, and then utilize the tick chart to identify any changes in momentum and to manage my risk. Now, once we pass that 11 o'clock mark and the mark, market times to slow and people go to lunch, uh, uh, price falls below VWAP and we put in a lower high, I like to move my stop to VWAP uh, to make the trade completely risk-free and make it a winning trade. And then finally, to um, cover the trade, I, I, I will close it at the end of the day. So for some intraday fundamentals here, you can see we have a pretty wide 52-week range. Uh, from $1.30, which was the low put in a couple weeks, uh, a couple days ago. And then we also have that 18 from its IPO. Uh, and I also want to throw in the ATR in the day range. So the ATR on this one was just about 20 cents versus the day range, which was up almost 90 cents. So it's definitely um, uh, provided a, a decent range to trade off of here. Uh, and then we have its AVOL versus its daily volume. So you can see we have massive volume on the day it was traded opposed to its average volume. And then I just threw in the uh, shares, outstanding institutional ownership, the market cap, our vol, shares float, and the short percentage. Um, but one thing I did want to do is um, show that DD came up on a lot of my market views, given its significant R vol, so almost that 10 R vol, uh, along with its net percent change. Um, and then a lot of the other China names are moving on this regulatory news. Uh, so as I said before, that DD is doing almost 10 R vol, uh, 10, 10 times its average daily volume. Uh, along with the news catalyst, uh, this wanted, uh, definitely wanted me to be involved in something like this. So now what is the catalyst, the setup, and the trade? So A and B, we have the easing of the regulation and the delisting. Now, uh, the setup is a day one gap fade meme version, and the trade for me was an open retracement short. So here's the four hour chart. As you can see here, we have a macro downtrend similar to the daily chart, uh, but I just want to throw this in to kind of zoom in uh, periodically uh, to see what's going on. So here we have a 30 minute chart, and as you can see, we have a massive gap up into the $3 mark, and we ended up clicking, uh, hitting 315 uh, in the pre-market, um, and then ended up selling off uh, throughout the day. But one thing I do want to point out is that elevated volume, uh, as, as this trade was uh, one of the highest traded tickers on the day. So now we have the technical analysis as the, on the five minute. As you can see, we have the gap up from the pre-market. We ran up in the pre-market, and we put in this consolidation right before open. Then we ended up selling off into the 272 range and putting in this uh, second consolidation where we ended up breaking below the pre-market support and then putting in a, second consol a third consolidation into the, into the afternoon session and then selling off into the close. Uh, now you can see here we have strong volume on the open and strong volume on the close. So there was definitely some sort of either institution uh, getting in or, uh, or getting out. Um, and then I also want to throw in that we failed to reclaim the pre-market highs on open. So now this is where I start to work into what the trade was for me. Um, and also here I want to throw in, uh, we have those retracements to VWAP. And then once we broke down that pre-market support, you could really see that sellers were really in control um, as there was a little bit of a volume spike uh, over the, I also have here a uh, average line for volume. So as you can see, once we sold out on that, sold down on that pre-market support, we ended up uh, picking up over the average volume, so definitely some increased volume on there. Uh, but mainly just wanted to show uh, technical analysis for this five minute chart. So now what is the technology that I use for, to find a trade like this and make a trade like this? Um, I have market views and I also run a gap fade script, which is my playbook. Um, so for the market view, this runs every second throughout the trading day and it populates um, the tickers uh, that I then will back test within uh, my, my script that I have uh, and this will output the probability of the stock closing below its open. And now these output statistics will match my gap fade uh, playbook, and this is what we're going over, uh, and then I'll make trades based upon um, those uh, outputted statistics. Um, so for the market view I have here, uh, we have them sorted from highest percent change to lowest. Now I ended up grabbing the screenshot at the end of the day, so it doesn't really look accurate right now, opposed to what it looked like in the morning. But DD was at the top of the list, um, 
and it was uh, one of the highest, as you can see here, I have it sorted by percent change, not by accumulated volume. But Didi was at the top of my, at the top of my list uh, as, one of, as it was one of the highest traded tickers on the day. So I have some rules for this market view that helps me figure out what the tickers are doing in my head. Um, I also have them here. Uh, so if the ticker is trading a percent change over 100, I have it highlighted uh, with black text. And if the uh, ticker's R vol is over five, I have it highlighted with yellow with black text. And then if the R vol and the ticker percent changes is greater than 100 uh, and greater than five, uh, I will have it green with white text. Um, so I just have the Python code for that here outputted. Uh, but now we'll move into the gap fade script that I run on all the tickers that will come through this market view. So this is more of like a step two step process for me to figure out if this is a trade that is worth taking or not. Um, so, so some of the simple qualifications that I have to make sure this is a trade that I would want to take is the symbol length has to be less than four, so equal to or less than four. So I don't want to take anything or I, this basically will take all the stocks in the universe and will figure out what is not a warrant. So I don't want to see some OTC. I don't want to see no warrants. I want to take all those and, and, and get them out of there. Next, I will have the net percentage change has to be greater than 10. Arval has to be greater than 2.5. Uh, cumulative volume has to be greater than a million. Uh, the gap percent change has to be greater than 20, and the average gap percent change when it does gap has to be over 20%. Now, I, I look at a bunch of output statistics uh, when I run this script, and it helps me gauge um, whether I should press the, t uh, the ticker with a lot of risk or if I should press it with uh, a, a certain percent of my daily stop, uh, say a 30% or a 20% or even a 10%. Basically, just gives me a gauge to where I can see if I want to risk a lot on the trade or if I don't. Um, so some of those statistics that I will uh, output are the average percent gain uh, from open when it closes above its open, the previous gap over the qualification amount, which I put in as 20, uh, the number of times we close below open uh, in an integer and in a percentage uh, change, in a, in a percentage, uh, the average percent fade from the open uh, to the close. So this will show me change intraday to the negative side, uh, the average low from open when it closes below its open, and then the previous day gap volume um, over the input amount and the input amount I have as a million. These stats will help me grade my gap fade to figure out if I want to press it with a lot of risk or if I don't. So this will give you a uh, outlook to see how this works. Uh, so I've run this uh, script on all the tickers that populate in the market view. Uh, and this will give me a criteria that I, that I mentioned in the previous slide and it will plot arrows on my chart. Uh, in simple terms, the more arrows are, more po are populated on the chart, the more conviction I have, uh, statistically backtested, that the stock will close below its open. So the script will run uh, throughout the day uh, as, as my market view populates, and I will take those and run it into this. Now, in simple terms, uh, the more arrows on the chart, uh, the more conviction I have, statistically backtested, that the stock will close below its open. It makes sense. So you're visually representing yeah. edge. That's all that you're doing. It's not more complex than that, but I think it's really, really interesting. So, um, you know, that's different people are going to need to see edge in different ways. But whenever if you know that you are a visual learner, you want to you're going to want to play into those strengths as much as possible. And so using utilizing technology to help you do that is a really cool way. So those examples are really nice because, you know, listen, like, these, these arrows, statistically, I have edge when I backtest them. So that's, that's just a, a huge thing. Like you can't really, it's very difficult to undervalue things that really help you be, you know, help you set the context the right way. It doesn't mean you're gonna be right in them. It doesn't mean, you know, you see MULN, it looks like it was, you were wrong one day, right the next day, right? It looks like, you know, you were wrong one day, right the next day. Like, that doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what matters is, did you put yourself in a position to have a lot of success on the day? And it looks like this is just something that's visually going to help you get into a position to put yourself in the right, right spot for the day. Absolutely. Uh, I, I wanted to throw in these other examples to, as you said before, to visualize and, and really show you guys how um, you can see this on the chart uh, and it can really visualize uh, my edge. Um, so as you can see here, I added in some other tickers I've traded in the past um, and you know, there, there is massive edge here, as you say. I, I mean, more, the more um, 
arrows I have, the more edge I have. So for reading the tape, uh, I did not capture tape on this trade, uh, nor did I get TOS on demand to work. Um, but this really wasn't a tape trade for this setup. Uh, but I did use the tape though to manage risk uh, as we popped into VWAP to see if there's any, any buyers there or any institutions looking um, to, uh, to dump. And um, this, uh, to improve this error, I added a calendar meeting uh, in my uh, calendar that reminds me to record my screens uh, along with a sticky note on my monitor. Um, so this, this will, won't happen again. This was just a little bit of an error because we were transitioning into the office and I didn't have my, my setup yet. I was still kind of getting used to the, the new setup. Um, but yeah, this was not really much of a tape trade, but just want to throw this in here. And one thing that's interesting is, and we don't talk about this as much as we really should on the desk, but there are trades that when you have edge on a daily time frame, you want to be executing them more on a daily time frame. You don't want to be thinking, you don't want to be thinking of those on a two minute time frame. Yes, you have to manage risk and that's what reading the tape is about, but you're really, you're executing those on a daily time frame. If your bet essentially, and your statistical probability shows that the open is, that the close is going to be below the open, um, you know, within uh, a reasonable amount, you're going to want to manage your risk to the opening price versus managing your risk necessarily on the tape. Um, so that might mean sizing down your trade. It might mean thinking in higher time frames. It might mean that as much as it pains me to say it, you actually don't watch the tape as much. But, you know, I do think on that initiation part of the trade, um, you do want to you do want to enter the trade using the tape as much as possible. So, you know, we talked about this prior to, to the to us hopping onto this call that, you know, I can see it both ways. You know, yes, we require people to, to we want people to get good at reading the tape. But there are also times that honestly, like, like very, if you're going to swing a position, you need to read the tape on entry and then you need to kind of read the tape as it as a check in through the day when it gets to interesting inflection points. But you're more managing that trade on a higher time frame. So, you know, when that occurs, you just want to manage it on a higher time frame. So for the trade management, uh, we popped uh, back into the opening price and VWAP. And here as I was fighting for price, uh, adding small size back and forth to make sure I had a decent entry and I wasn't off sides. Uh, and then once we uh, pop back into VWAP again, I added um, more for my main core. Um, and then I also threw in here, we should have added, I should have added here, but we were in a meeting, so I, I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, but uh, after hours here, I did cover at 239, uh, a little bit above here. Um, this was uh, not shown on the chart just because trader view just doesn't show it, but um, it, it was over here. So what did I learn from this trade? I learned how one needs to know the full story within a stock. I needed to know that one, China was lightening their regular uh, regulations of the Chinese companies, but I also needed to know that Didi was soon to be delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. So this gap could bring in increased selling from any US bag holders from the IPO. Now, how could I have done this better? Uh, I added, I could have added at the last retracement to VWAP, but we were in a meeting, which I just mentioned. Uh, and now how would I have taken this trade differently? Um, as my trading career develops, I have get access to pre-market and after hours trading, and I would have hit this pre-market at 310, as this would have provided a lot better risk to reward initially, uh, opposed to initially hitting in uh, after the open. Uh, I could have hit in at 310 risking 315, which was pre-market highs, opposed to hitting uh, at $3 risking 305. Now this would have generated a lot more profit and alpha on the trade. So basically what I would have done is I would have entered in this consolidation here, risking 315, mm -hmm. uh, opposed to entering down here, now, as you can see, once we hop below that three, all the increased selling hits in. And now what a risk I run to this is as my trading career develops and I want to start using bigger size, uh, as this increased selling comes in, I might not get the amount of um, size that I wanted to. Now, uh, given I did get the size I wanted to on this trade, uh, later I might have not, uh, might have not as I trade bigger. Um, so I could have hit in here pre-market and this consolidation risking just the highs there. Um, which would have been a better risk to reward and it also would have provided better alpha because the you know the, the change would have the percent change would have been higher so I would have created more profit. Two ways to look at this trade as you develop uh, you know one you, you can talk about getting more size two you can just talk about staying more active in the trade you know more size obviously is going to be an important factor but staying more active in the trade but really pre-market you don't really have a ton of information what if this would have LRP'd up right off the open? Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you're like, hey, listen, I need to get all my size pre-market, like that's actually it's one of the toughest things to do in trading is to, to predict that you're going to be right from pre-market because you never really know. What if somebody was short this and this was their reason to cover? And, you know, there was another Chinese IPO, LKNCY or something like that, Luck and Coffee. And, you know, they were going to be delisted and they were going to go trade pink sheets and they had a positive news catalyst. And I think it LRP'd up like four times in a row. And so, you know, it's it's like like right off the, the open on a similar catalyst. And so like the pre-market thing I think is right. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, your goal is to if this is likely going to close at low of day or close below the open, I need to think through all the different ways I could get involved in this trade in a, in a responsible way um, and then be open to whatever shows up, you know, because your goal is, is to, once you really see it, to take advantage of that. And you might see it in a couple different ways, but when you stack all the edges in your favor, like you have, um, then it just comes down to what are the different trades? You know, not all of them will be as cleanly downtrending as that one was, some of them will get really sloppy and nasty and, you know, really actually tricky. And you want to prepare yourself for that because when you do get those big edge opportunities like you've identified in this trade, um, utilizing the technology, I think it's an important thing to make sure that you're make sure that you're capturing the the opportunity regardless of exactly how it plays out. So studying, okay, I'll start pre-market with this tier. If it does this, then I'll do, then I'll add. If it does this, then I'll add. Um, you know, those are all little things that you can do to improve your trading. Overall, I think you're utilizing technology really well, which is a, a big thing. Uh, you know, and it, it probably, what are you getting, two or three of these a month? Um, I usually get a couple each day, um, but then I grade them. Um, so like okay. realistically, an A++, A++ I, I get probably like I would say three times a month, four times a month. That's pretty good. That's actually really good. Um, plus to an A++ is like, if I get two of those a month, that's a big deal. So the fact that you're getting three or four, it means you're really using technology very well. Um, so that's, that's a really exciting thing. Um, what one thing that you kind of, that we kind of jumped over, but I think is maybe the most interesting thing that you've said in this entire playbook is you grading them after you get the outcome. That is something that if you can grade the quality of your setups based on all the criteria and you're doing that on a repeated, in a repeated manner, or you have all the information of the trade, right? You're not going back and saying that was an A plus setup. Look at that in the past. You're actually saying, I think this is an A, I think this is a B, I think, what do you, what's your score? What's your scale? Is it A, B, C? Uh, I use one out of 10. One out of 10 is even better. Um, because it just yeah. gives me more of uh, like in between kind of thing opposed to like ABC, which would be like, you know, 33, 33, 33. One out of 10 gives me, you know, 10% in between. It gives you a little more room, right? So I think that that's, I think that's an awesome, awesome way to do it. So that is a best practice of, you know, if you get a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, there's a big difference. A six is probably, yeah, it's fine, but I need a lot to happen. A seven is, hey, I should pay attention, you know, I could probably get, you know, be set up, you know, maybe, maybe be something like that. Eight, nine, and 10 is probably where you're going to make your money. And so, you know, and, and anything below a five, it's just sort of like, it's not even worth my time. But the habitual process of grading them will give you way more edge than you could ever imagine. So I think that's a huge opportunity there. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so let's run through the scorecard for this. So stock selection. I just have it right here. Stock selection, I'd give you a 10. I think that was very good. Um, big picture, I'd give you a 10. I like the way that you um, I like the way that you defined the two different almost prairie and viewpoints that you could hold. Um, I think that that understanding both and being respectful of both is really important. Um, you know, it does allow the narrative to get skewed a little bit when you're trying to decide is it a long or a short, but I, I do think it's, I think being aware of both is a really important factor. Uh, trade strategy, 
you know, I give you a nine. I think that, like you said, like you identified something that would be different and something you could do a little differently. So I think overall a nine is pretty good there. Um, intraday fundamentals, um, given the factors involved, I thought you did really well. So that's a 10. Uh, technical analysis, I thought was a 10. Reading the tape, you know, I'm going to give you a four because like the reality is I, I don't necessarily, I think we have to read the tape every time, but you know, when we discussed this offline, you were kind of, you helped me see that this really isn't a trade that you, you're managing in a higher time frame. So, you know, I think a four is fine there. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to read the tape in that sort of trade because you have kind of, you're thinking of it in a, in a more universal fashion. Um, trade management, I thought was really good. Um, you know, I'd give you a nine there. Technology, 10. Uh, review, 10. And diligence, 10. So, you know, overall, um, yeah, so 92 total. I think that's good. Sorry, I'm watching too many things on my screens at one time. Um, I'm trading a lot of things right now. Uh, more than I'm used to, and it's making me uncomfortable, actually. But, uh, yeah, so 92 total score. Um, you know, obviously, I think that the ways to improve this, um, I think your trade strategy can improve a little bit um, from the perspective that you can open yourself up to a lot of different ways that this could trade out. Um, but I, I, I think you're pretty much in the right place. Obviously, reading the tape, like identifying the most important moments for that, like you said, like that little wick up where you were like we were in the meeting, like having that on tape so you can relive that, like that moment can be really scary for a couple people. So, um, so you know that that's really tough. Um, trade management, I think, yeah, like you know, really knowing where you're going to cover, really staying with it, like like. But overall, I thought you did a really good job, and it's it's a it's a good example of this how you can respond when you're given these conflicting catalysts hey go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community and please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at smb train and trade well